Let's talk about how magmas ascend. So why do magmas ascend? Magma at depth is held at high pressure by the strength of the surrounding rock. And if a magma source connected to a lower pressure re regime, pre the pressure difference creates a thrust which drives the magma upward. And an upward thrust is driven by a decrease in pressure which causes expansion. This movie is going to show you several things, including what's taking place beneath the volcano in an area uh, above the magma chamber in this vesiculation region where we have the exolution of gases starting uh, through to when we get fragmentation that divides the area with magma and gases from the eruption column. Let's watch the movie and we can discuss the processes as we see them take place. First, we're going to see magma rising and bubbles forming. Magma's rising, bubbles are forming, and the eruption begins. We see bombs and blocks of magma traveling along trajectories as they fall out of the eruption column. The plume is moving in the direction of the prevailing winds and ash particles are falling out of the eruption column. We see the three regions of the eruption column. Bubbles dissipate, the plume subsides, and ash settles from the plume. And then the viscous degassed magma rises slowly to form a lava dome in the crater. Let's watch that one more time. Bubbles are forming, magma's rising. The eruption begins. The eruption column is rising out of the volcano. We see the gas thrust region, the convective thrust region, and the umbrella region. You can see the bubbles are dissolving out of the magma. The bubbles are dissipating. And the lava dome rises. So we just saw in that last movie this exolution surface where bubbles start to exolve out of the magma as the pressure is decreased on the magma. We see the fragmentation surface, which is the area within that uh, magma chamber separating the magma and bubbles from the eruption column. And there are two mechanisms taking place here. There's an acceleration of the ascent of the magma and a sudden decompression that allows the gases to exhale. We're seeing a progressive exolution and the bubble growth stages as we move upward out of the magma chamber. You'll see the number of bubbles grows, the size of the bubbles grow until it reaches this fragmentation surface where the eruption actually takes place. There's evidence of the way that the bubbles grow from preserved particles that have been erupted out of these volcanoes and we can see that there are small bubbles in between larger bubbles. The acceleration is due to the onset of the vesiculation and the bubble growth. The bubbles form and grow leading to the development of a mixture with a lower density and that provides an upward acceleration in the conduit. As the bubbles grow they merge and eventually form a foam that disintegrates because of the high strain rates in the bubbles and the, and the melt mixture and the tensile strength of the melt is exceeded. High strain rates lead to the development of very thin bubble walls that rupture as the magma accelerates up the conduit. The rapid decompression of the already vesiculated magma, bubbles in the melt suddenly are exposed to lower pressure 
and that develops the fragmentation surface, which is the surface where the bubble disruption occurs. And as bubbles burst, the pressure in the adjacent row of bubbles, that pressure decreases and that process yields a fragmentation wave. The deposit characteristics can reveal information about the fragmentation mechanisms. For example, Vulcanian eruptions typically have a narrow range of size distribution of the pyroclasts. And you see in the diagram to the left that they're less than four millimeters in diameter. That suggests fragmentation mechanism is decompression and in a fragmentation wave. Plinian deposits have a bimodal distribution and you can see from the diagram that they span a much larger range of particle size. Pumice can form as the magma accelerates the large class size is preserved because some volatiles are able to migrate out of the magma, perhaps in higher permeability areas, and ash is a result of the decompression wave through lower permeability areas. And so we're looking at more than one kind of fragmentation mechanism in a Plinian eruption. This graph shows the gas volume fraction and the conduit length from the exolution surface to the fragmentation surface and up to the vent. And you see that the gas volume increases rapidly as the pressure is decreasing. And then there's a sudden change and a sudden increase in the gas volume fraction at the fragmentation surface when the eruption occurs. And again, a, a dramatic decrease in the pressure at that same fragmentation surface. So in fragmentation, the rising magma can begin to fragment when a bubble volume reaches 65 to 70 volume percent. Fragmentation can occur because bubbles become overpressurized and burst. This can also occur because the melt film between bubbles is so thin that they act as brittle materials. The thin film bursts when the stress exceeds their strength. When the bubbles burst, the, the material changes from a mixture of bubbles in a continuous stream of melt to droplets of melt in a continuous stream of gas. That changes the viscosity and the density of the mixture drastically. The mixture accelerates up the conduit, it can reach supersonic speeds, and the mixture of gas and particles that exits the eruption conduit is called the eruption column. So here's a, a photo of Mount Readout in Alaska and an eruption in 1990. Let's talk more about um, eruption clouds and plumes. The eruption column is defined as droplets of melt or molten material and quenched melt, so glass particles, crystals, uh, pieces of country rock or wall rock, those lithic fragments that show up in the tufts that we've looked at. And they're all dispersed in a continuous gas phase. The mixture erupted out of the volcanic vent or crater happens vertically or laterally or subvertically at velocities up to several hundred meters per second. Initially, a density of the mixture is greater than the surrounding atmosphere. As the material is thrust upward, it incorporates or mixes with cooler surrounding air in the column. The atmosphere heats up and the density of the mixture becomes lower than the surrounding atmosphere. Eventually, the mixture has the same density as the surrounding air and atmosphere. Friction at the outer boundaries between the air and the, the eruption column causes some gravitational fallout of particles. So here are the parts of the eruption column. There's the gas thrust region, the convective thrust or convective ascent region, and the umbrella region. The gas thrust region is driven by gas expansion. The convective ascent region is driven by a constant release of the thermal energy from the internal ash. The umbrella region 
is at the top of the eruption column and sometimes it's called the downwind plume. In the gas thrust or jet region, we have a mixture of pyroclasts and gas jetted um, 100 to thousands of meters into the atmosphere by the initial acceleration of the eruption. The nozzle velocity is defined as the maximum velocity to which the pyroclast plus gas can be accelerated by the expansion of the magmatic gases. It's 100 meters per second for Strombolian or Hawaiian um, effusive eruptions to over 600 meters per second for more explosive Plinian eruptions. The nozzle velocity is controlled mainly by the volatile content in the magma, and that controls the explosive pressure in the fragmentation zone. The jet or gas thrust phase typically extends up to several kilometers above the vent, um, and the column width is narrow. So this whole area is in the lower part of the eruption column. In the convective ascent region, it's highly turbulent and the cool surrounding air is mixed into the column. Air is heated up and the resulting expansion decreases the density of the mixture. And that transition occurs when the bulk density is less than the surrounding atmosphere. The forces driving the motion is dominated by buoyancy and the mixture rises like a, a hot air balloon. The mixture rises as a convective eruption column or plume. So convection, the width of the column is increasing too. The convective part can rise tens of kilometers upward with vertical velocities um, varying from 10 to 100 meters per second. The velocity is a function of the source conditions, though. And the maximum velocity is reached in the core of the plume, so sort of the center. At the edges, the particles encounter lower velocities, and they're insufficient to keep the particles aloft. Some fall back to the surface, and more in a minute on that topic. In the umbrella region, the density of the atmosphere decrease with height. So the convective part of the plume eventually reaches a level of neutral buoyancy. And the buoyancy is no longer the driving force. And the plume will start to move laterally at this level of neutral buoyancy. Here. Excess momentum will carry some of the particles higher to the top of the plume. This lateral movement forms a distinctive mushroom or umbrella-shaped region. When the jet does not incorporate enough air into the mixture to maintain buoyancy, the rising jet will decelerate until the height where the velocity reaches zero. The plume density in all or part of the column is greater than the atmosphere. Particles will fall back to the surface. This essentially results in the collapse of the column and the jet transforms into a tephra fountain and that leads to the formation of pyroclastic density currents or pyroclastic flows. So some examples of eruption columns and plumes. This is Mount St. Helens and you can see the density current on the side of the volcano and the eruption column going vertically up. This is uh, in Rabaul in Papua New Guinea in 1994 Two volcanic cones on the opposite sides of this caldera began erupting with little warning. And the photo shows a large white billowing eruption plume that's carried in a westerly direction by a, a weak prevailing wind. At the base of the eruption column is a layer of yellow-brown ash being distributed by lower level winds. This is a photo of Tongariro in New Zealand in 1975. It was a volcanian explosion from this volcano that ejected a dark, ash-laden cloud. And large meter-scale blocks um, and trailing streamers of ash can be seen in the eruption column. The blocks are up to 20 meters across and were projected 
hundreds of meters above the vent. Another type of volcanic plume forms in association with pyroclastic flows and surges, which are mixtures of hot particles and hot gases that are denser than the surrounding atmosphere. As the flows travel away from the source, sedimentation of particles from the base of the flow and heating of the entrained air decreases the bulk density. These secondary or co bright plumes are generated from the tops of flows by a buoyant rise. This allows the plumes to have much larger aerial distribution. In 1980, Mount St. Helens gave us a good example of, of the formation of a co bright plume. The pyroclastic flow is moving at 100 meters per second and covered an area of 600 square kilometers. But when the flow decelerated, the finer particles became buoyant because of the heating of the entrained air. And this secondary or co bright plume ascended to 25 kilometers above Earth's surface. This is what one looks like. We have a pyroclastic flow that heats up entrained air. Sedimentation occurs where the larger, denser particles are deposited at the base of the flow. And because both of these processes, concentration of particles and the density of the material decreases, and eventually the density is less than the surrounding atmosphere and a buoyant cloud or plume develops. The co bright plume lacks a gas thrust or a jet region so it begins ascent with a relatively low velocity. And a source area, the radius tend to be much larger than those of the primary plume. And this is also going to develop an umbrella region. Here's a pyroclastic flow and co bright plume on Pinatubo. The pyroclastic flow is down against the ground, the co bright plume rising up from that pyroclastic flow. This is from Makian in Indonesia. It's a, a vigorous eruption column rises above the volcano. This was a six-day eruption that produced eruption columns that reached eight to ten kilometers in altitude. The pyroclastic flows reached the coast of the island where all the residents had to be evacuated and a flat top lava dome was extruded at the summit crater at the end of the eruption. So to conclude, let's look at this movie again, where we've got the magma down beneath the volcano that will rise up to an exolution surface where gases will start to exolve out of the magma because pressure has been decreased. Then it will enter a vesiculation region where the bubble size is increasing and the number of bubbles is increasing until it reaches a fragmentation surface where those bubbles start to burst and the eruption column begins. So bubbles are forming, rising and growing larger. Fragmentation is taking place. The eruption column starts with the gas thrust region, a convective thrust region and the umbrella region and we see particles falling out of the eruption plume. Then the bubbles dissipate, the plume subsides, and ash settles out. A viscous, degassed magma rises slowly to form a lava dome.